being here and I, I said Would thank you. Like yeah. yeah, because okay, I, I want to show after we can yeah. probably move on. Uh, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for the invitation and thank my colleague Professor Reddock for also I was in Warwick and Leeds <laughs> doing two lectures and uh, Professor Reddock and I believe you Professor Guitar has Rodriguez. Okay. <laughs> Thought it would be a good idea for me to come over and and I was mm -hmm. able to actually smoothly do it. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so I think what we thought we would do is like have a, a sort of small presentation first and then we'll have a conversation based on questions, right? Uh, and then um, we'll engage you. So should I, do you want to add anything else to this? Sort of format, or, or is that enough? Oh, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, since I, I was the person who um, was identified as going first, let me start. So essentially, um, this logic of circulations for me, um, I tried to um, advance um, in a book I did recently called Caribbean Spaces, and I was looking at. First of all, there was a short essay. Uh, at a conference held in Oxford on the U.S.-U.K. relationship, and I was looking at the fact that when one thinks of Caribbean intellectual activists uh, and the range of them, um, if you are reading the material, you know, uh, the Pan-Africanists and so on, um, generally um, the logic is that they move from one place to the next. But what I began to see from looking at all of them, Claude McKay, Padmo, all of them, is that it weren't really just staying in one place, that they were circulating. Uh, and I wanted to sort of apply that logic. Um, and it was part of my earlier, sort of extending my earlier work on migrations, which, as you know, particularly now living in the United States where the question of migration has become such a troubled um, discourse, um, the idea of migrations to me for Caribbean subjects, not just intellectuals, had to do with a range of things, not just going to find a better life as, as it was fr framed by the sociologist earlier, but a series of movements in terms of how the Caribbean subject is positioned internationally. And I think that's really what I want to uh, keep always at the forefront. Um, so whichever one of them you look, even the Marcus Garvey, who then is constructed as the person with back to Africa and sort of romantic return, actually did a series of circulations, Panama, the Caribbean, uh, Central Caribbean, uh, Central America, and so on. So I wanted to reframe it in my own conceptualizing of it beyond the sort of migration from one place to the next. My work um, on Claudia Jones uh, then fit into that framework because in terms of Claudia Jones herself, she leaves the Caribbean when she's eight years old and migrates to the United States, lives there for all of her life pretty much, and then goes to the UK. So she similarly does the same kind of movement in a, in a different, for different logic. Of course, she has the political reasons why she was forced out of the United States. Um, but, but I saw a similar pattern taking place because she doesn't just do that. She goes to China, she goes to the Soviet Union, and so on. And of course, when we can come back to Amy Ashwood Garvey, that question will come up even further. This is one of my favorite photographs of her because she's actually going to court. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, it's quite a fashionable way of, of entering Foley Square, New York, um, being tried as a communist. <laughs> so everything is matching, even the sunglasses. Right? And, and that's one of the things I see in Left of Karl Marx, and, and that is documented, that this group of communists that she belonged to was identified as sort of radical chic. They, they, they lived a life that was quite um, culturally sophisticated. They hung out and so on. So it was not the way in which they were constructed by the dominant US machine. Hopefully it will move, right? It has moved. <laughs> How does it advance? So I'm, I'm going to work through some of the questions that come out of the, the PowerPoint. It, okay. it didn't move at all. Strange. Normally it moves, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. But so what did we do? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do to make it better one? <laughs> okay. So there's a famous um, quote by C.L.R. James, which explains some of this. Uh, and for James, this is at the end of Black Jacobins. He, he's one, he is the one who says that the people of the West Indies, as it says here, um, you know, were born in the 17th century in a westernized 
productive and social system. There was therefore in West Indian society an inherent antagonism between the consciousness of the black masses and the reality of their lives. Inherent in that it was not constantly produced and reproduced, not by agitators, but by the very conditions of the society itself. And I love to hold that quote because he's saying that the, the tendencies that in terms of looking at black radicals are somehow, you know, coming through in a certain kind of way that privilege is just agitating. He is arguing that the conditions of plantation life and the conditions of, of, of the social structures in which they were located and economic structures created the, the very antagonisms and therefore they were acting in response uh, with, to those questions. Ah, okay. For me then, feminism, and, and we're talking about black left feminisms, right? Um, it is doing a series of things. It's questioning master narratives of all sorts. So the working definition that I have, and everyone has loves his or her own working definition, usually her working definition, um, is that it's a series of political movements, also positions and interventions, ideological struggles, theoretical assertions, sociocultural practices, and various qualifiers more specific, with more specific orientations. Um, and that political activity for women's rights has appeared in many locations. So that, of course, the logic that is just coming from the West has been debunked by African feminist scholars and definitely Caribbean feminist scholars as well. Claudia Jones uh, would write, she was a journalist, and she, um, in that collection that was mentioned, Beyond Containment, um, I republished a, a pamphlet that she wrote for Ben Davis, the councilman from Harlem. There were two groups of communists who were tried. Ben Davis was in the first group. Actually, he went blind in prison. Um, and, and somebody, I know there's a young woman who is at Carleton College named Sherry Burton Stelly who is working on the ill effects or the, the negative effects um, on health and well-being of, the, of that group of radicals and subsequent ones, of course, one could look even at the Black Panthers, some of them are still in prison. Um, but the negative effects on their health um, is a question that has to be really addressed in terms of how the U.S. state um, treated them. Now, she um, would similarly um, have a heart condition and, and was released from prison early than the one year and a day. They would give them a year and a day uh, for, for a different reason. We'll talk about it if you want later. Um, but she was released uh, after serving 10 months in the federal penitentiary in Allison, West Virginia. Uh, because of her heart condition. So the question of health is interesting. But she penned a pamphlet in defense of Ben Davis, and it's in there that she talks about being a radical. Uh, and she's talking here about the fact that, the, again, like, like James says, the very conditions in which uh, black people were located meant that they would end up having to take a radical position. Um, so basically she's talking about the very core, she says, of all Negro history, the, the term they were using then is radicalism. Radicalism against conformity to chattel slavery, against the betrayal of the demands of reconstruction, and so on. And um, the very real meaning, she says in that same piece, of any serious leadership in the fight for Negro rights brings one then in opposition with the foreign and domestic policies of the government. Ask yourself, can anyone support the great national liberation struggles of peoples of Africa without facing the accusation of being a communist, whether in writing, speeches, or needed organizational endeavors? Any Negro leader who pursues any necessary manifestation of leadership is labeled subversive communistic. Now, I'm sure, I, I don't know if you all follow the US elections, but you would note that 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 term, uh, uh, you know, and whenever there's a a, a, a a political come in, let me wait for them to come in. Whenever there's a political figure who articulates, there's a chair. Yeah. There's a chair there. Any any position that's critical of dominant capitalistic culture, then they get defined as socialist. So this is what Trump was saying. Oh, they're just socialists, and this is repeated over and over again. So she say, and this was lev levied, as you know, at people like. Martin Luther King was not a communist at all, but essentially the question of critiquing dominant culture about a certain black rights um, in, in any kind of way ends up being labeled then as communistic. And there are a couple of scholars who have done this well. Gerald Horn, I don't know if you read his work, uh, has a book about black and red in which he talks about, about that same question. W.B. Du Bois, 
uh, many people. And some of them eventually became communists. <laughs> but they um, didn't necessarily start off like that, right? Um, so Claudia, um, I found, and this is a poem that is included in there. There are 15 poems that she wrote. Um, and um, they were many of them were written while she was incarcerated. And just backing up, she was incarcerated for doing a speech called International Women's Day and the Struggle for Peace. That is identified as the so-called Overt Act, which led to her being tried. And if you read the FBI files, that's what's identified. So technically, she's a political prisoner who then gets um, on the other side of the United States government because of a speech on for women's rights and the question of peace, <laughs> which was then seen as pretty radical. When she goes to prison, um, to the federal prison in Alderson, West Virginia, she um, is incarcerated at the same time as the Puerto Rican nationalists who were, had been struggling for independence of Puerto Rico. Again, an issue still with us, I mean, following the last Hurricane Irma and Maria and the way that Puerto Rico was treated um, by the United States government or not treated, not treated at all. Um, and you have visuals of the president throwing toilet paper and um, kitchen paper at people and so on. Um, and then, of course, still reconstruction has not happened um, is an issue. So there's this logic then uh, for, for Claudia um, in her relationships with these women when she is in prison um, that, that is captured really well here. And it's a poem, I gather, since many of you are literary people, this should be something that you might find interesting, the whole question of how she I is able to write about um, her friendship with, not her friendship, but her, her, un her understanding of this person, Consuela, who actually, as she calls her, Sp a wondrous Spanish sister, anti-fascist sister, and so on. Um, but... Uh, uh, Consuela is Blanca Canales Torresola. She was sent to Allison Federal Prison Camp in Allison, West Virginia, the same prison in which Lolita Lebron would be sent in 1954 and Claudia Jones in 1955. And people, whenever I talked about this, people would find it really funny that they had all the radicals in jail in the same place at the same time, where they could meet and so on. And in fact, Claudia, um, there was another the woman who was the president of the Women's Commission of the CPUSA, uh, Ellen Gurley Flynn, um, she um, she one day um, said to Claudia, there's a little woman who is always smiling at me every time I see her. Who is that? And she said, oh, that's Lily Tillebron. Yeah. <laughs> and this is in Gurley Flynn's autobiography. But anyway, they, um, there was a march for her in Puerto Rico, for Blanca, uh, and eventually they were released from prison and this is an interesting photograph that you can find of them um, in um, in uh, it's some of this is available of course if you search under their names online but she uh, Blanca was identified as the person who actually <coughs> called out the fact or declared Puerto Rico independent uh, and so Claudia Jones in prison builds a sort of relationship politically and consciously with these women who were actively involved in the struggle for uh, liberation. Um, so this is Blanca Canales Torresola, 1906 to 1996. She was pardoned in 1967. Now, you know, there are a number of ways of thinking about Caribbean discourse, particularly for people like me who work in literature. And a lot of people go back to Guisan because Guisan talks about the whole question of Caribbean identity as a kind of a, a kind of intellectual hope or dream. Um, he calls it in the end a multiple set of relationships. Um, and in other words, it's something that people still aspire to. It, it's not, not the geography alone does not assume, you know, all of the relationships that we want to talk about. But notice he says it tears us free from the intolerable alternative of the need for nationalism. I think we still got caught in that because in the Caribbean still the, because of the way that flag independence happened, most people feel proud to claim their little flag and their country. And it's in the music, I mean, right? Anybody from Trinidad, anybody from <laughs> every every of those, every, if you go to any of the parties, or if you go on any of those cruises where they do all the instructional 
soca and stuff, you will hear that. <laughs> Put up your flag and so on. So essentially, it's part of the cultural makeup, but according to Guisson, you know, technically the idea was to have a kind of cross-cultural process, a different set of relationships, and somebody's working on transcultural relationships, um, so that you might find interesting. Anyway, young Claudia Jones, and I just, I was, when I was doing research on, on her at Northwestern University Library, I was blown away one day when I was in, in going through the archives and I found this. And this is Claudia Jones when she was about 19 or 20, and she's on the cover of the Young Communist Review. Stuart Hall um, has, for me, uh, also been significant as a cultural theorist because when he begins to think back about the Caribbean, um, he would similarly argue that migration has been a constant motif. It identifies, uh, it becomes a multiple as a series of identifications and re-identifications, a pageantry of shifting and mutable enduring Caribbean identities. And then, of course, the question of re -diasporization. I like the fact that he talks about re -diasporization. He actually defines that, that although you have the initial diasporas being created by people coming from different locations, Africa, Europe, and so on, then they move back to other locations, back to that logic of circulations, and they end up re themselves in other locations. So Claudia, of course, becomes founder um, when she gets to London after being deported from the United States. Um, she goes to London just after the, the Windrush generation migrates there in 1948 and founds the first newspaper, um, the West Indian Gazette and Afro-Asian Caribbean News, and out of that founds the first London Carnival in 1959. How does she get there? Back to this Caribbean left feminist question that we're going to keep open. Um, in her autobiographical history, she talks about being influenced to become a communist because of the Scottsboro Boys frame up. She says two things motivate her, the Scottsboro Boys um, and Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. So basically the domestic United States racial condition and then of course the international uh, via Mussolini. Uh, friends of mine who were communists, she said, began to have frequent discussions with her. She joined the party in 1936. Claudia um, is really, it, what is fascinating to me is that she is an 18 year old around this time. And around this time in Harlem, there would be a number of street corner speakers. Many of them would be talking about, Garvey did it, many of the others did it. Uh, they would all be talking about the questions of black people in the United States. She said she was most impressed with the way the Communist Party speakers framed the discussion. And it's because of that she joins the Communist Party. You know, the, the, you said you have undergraduates in the room. Mm -hmm. It would probably, I don't know if they know about the Scottsboro Boys. Some of the grad students probably yeah, know. Yeah. But these were nine uh, young African-American men. The youngest was 12, uh, who were tried repeatedly for raping two white women, allegedly raping two white women in a boxcar in Alabama. And of course it wasn't true. Um, eventually they were they were tried repeatedly. So eventually it was they would release them one by one, two by two and so on. And eventually it was proven that they're not. Fascinatingly the um, and I, I'm so happy about this, the lawyer for um, the Scottsboro boys from the Communist Party uh, bef because it was before the age of having digital stuff and visuals, actually had the train made up, uh, a replica of the train, and got the identification of where the girls were and where the guys were, and, and this was how he was able to prove that they didn't do it. They were in totally different parts of the train. This, this replica of this mm -hmm. train is at Cornell University's mm -hmm. law school, mm -hmm. so you can actually go and see it. And I find that fascinating. Okay. Anyway, what happens though is that she, in spite of the fact that she's joining and she's <laughs> interested in um, the questions of these these two issues, she begins to be um, identified as as somebody who is of interest to the FBI. Um, and when you go through the FBI files and you look to see what they were talking about as it relates to her, notice what it is. Back to her point about what marks you as being radical. 
so she says it's equal rights of women as well as equal equality for Negroes. That this is what the FBI file says they're finding mostly that she's talking about. Okay. And this is of course a image of the Scottsboro boys. So essentially what I'm wanting to at least indicate, and Dr. Redak has done really good work on Elmer Elmer Francois, and we'll probably come back to that, um, is that you have a series of women who are considered radical then who are ahead or with Claudia Jones or after her, um, uh, Amy Ashwood Garby for sure. And many of these are people that pe people should be doing more work on. I know somebody who's doing work on Amy Ashwood Garby, and I don't think it's finished. Um, a young woman who was, I met her at the Schomburg. Grace Campbell, who was one of the, one at one point was a leader of the African Blood Brotherhood. Brotherhood, notice the name. Of course, Blanca Canales, Tora Sula, Christina Lewis, Elma Francois, Susan Cesar, you know, is importantly identified. And of course, women of the Haitian Revolution. There's, so in other words, I, I want to argue that, that then we have a long history of activist women um, that parallels what happened in the United States in terms of the Tubman's, the Sojourner Truths, and so on. And this is, if one were to talk about it in kind of genealogy, then one would have to go back and try to find a way to work that out. I don't know if people have done that yet, to work out a kind of genealogy of mm -hmm. sort of Caribbean uh, feminist um, contributors. For example, Una Marston, and she is interesting, and I think you're going to talk about her, so I won't go into Una Marston in any great detail, but, but fascinating as well in terms of somebody who really understands these two questions. And so for me, in terms of Caribbean left feminism, one finds consistently that linking of questions of race, and, and my point about Claudia is that she represents that really well. Questions of race, questions of gender, questions of class, and definitely anti-imperialist, anti-colonial uh, issues that are also centrally indicated there. And Una Marston is a good example of that. So Claudia, um, in a nice piece called Under Right to Self-Determination for the Negro People of the Black Belt, which is in there, um, says, we communists adhere to the fundamental belief that complete and lasting equality of imperialist oppressed nations of people can be guaranteed only with the establishment of socialism. So she is, of course, identified as a socialist, as a Marxist. She is buried, and for my book um, published about her, she's buried left of Karl Marx. And I, <laughs> and I love this image for that one reason. That when you, and I have it, I'm standing there deliberately. My daughter took that photograph because normally I'm the one taking the photograph, but she was with me that day. Um, and I'm 5'9. The Marx bust is about 11 feet. Somebody's taking a photograph of it. It's about 11 feet tall. Every day there are flowers, candles, and stuff placed there. To the left of Marx is Claudia Jones on a flat stone on the ground. One of my friends just texted me yesterday because some, I, when I gave the talk at Warwick, somebody came to me with a photograph and had gone there. And she said, I wanted you to see this. Um, somebody who was in the audience and she was showing me the fact that there was a rose bush, which I had had planted there. And I had the rose bush planted right behind the, um, the, the that stone because of the fact that Marx always had flowers. And I was at a woman writers conference in Leicester and somebody said, you need to plant her a rose bush or something. And I went there, I bought the rose bush. If you have a good high gate, you have to go up the hill to the cemetery, find Karl Marx and you'll find Claudia. <laughs> and um, when I went back to the cemetery, I was told, the guy told me, well, they're closed. So I said, well, can you plant this to, uh, behind this, um, this flat stone next to Karl Marx, which is a woman who founded the carnival, which became Notting Hill, was a young gardener. And he said to me, well, if she did that, she needs this rose to be planted. So I, <laughs> I went away not knowing if he did it until somebody sent me photographs of the rose being there. Anyway, so that's <laughs> Claudia Jones left of Karl Marx. So, um, she goes to China after, and this is about a year before she dies, and she meets Chairman Mao. Um, she meets, uh, she talks with Madame Sun Ling Jin. She visits Yunnan. Um, and this is a really interesting photograph of her that I love because it has her next to Robeson and, um, and then um, Amy Ashwood Garvey. And um, so, I mean, this. In other words, she is somebody who moved in an intellectual circle. 
that also had its Pan-Africanist connections. And of course, as you know, Amy Ashwood Garvey was a Pan-Africanist, but also mm -hmm. identified herself as a feminist deliberately. Claudia Jones never identified herself as a feminist, but we do now, I do, looking back at her assertion of women's rights. Um, Amy Ashwood Garvey interestingly claims it, and she, after leaving Garvey, um, after a very short marriage, this is one of the ways she, that she indicates that she wanted to go and do her own thing. I had to go to the women of my race and help them on the scene of their special struggle. Uh, she agreed to discontinue the partnership which we started. Um, this is really an understatement if you've read anything about them. Now, according to Julia Sudbury, more recent people then tried to find ways to bring together these combinations of what these women were doing um, that, that we are talking about today in terms of Caribbean left or decolonial feminisms or however it's framed. But transnational feminist work, according to Julia Sudbury, does that. And she indicates all of the pieces, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, uh, and so on, developing transnational practices, um, understanding the gendered impacts of global economic and political restructuring. I like this definition because she tries to put into it a lot of other things. She says, unlike global feminism, transnational feminist practices do not depict women's oppression as unitary or universal, nor do they subscribe to the vision of women's experience as fragmented mosaic of cultural and national differences. Rather, this approach focuses on the linkages that emerge out of transnational networks of economic and social relations. So um, Amy Ashwood Garvey is identified in 1945 as calling, and people indicated she was the one, because Du Bois was late, I gather, is actually calling the conference to order. Um, and she is, of course, had been the first wife of Marcus Garvey and co-founder of the UNIA, but then she switches and her life becomes really very specifically directed, as indicated earlier, at looking at women's rights. She goes to Africa, she does a lot of work, uh, and I, I hear Cy Tony Martin's definition of her as really moving in a circle that was quite extensively pan-Africanist as well. But also, clearly, she was a friend and close confidant of Claudia Jones as well. I find then the Caribbean, and I'm, this is closing off my portion of this, and we'll come back to more specific questions, <laughs> that the Caribbean activists and all of them, if one were to, and I delib I'm glad I have Stokely here, because I, in my talk at Leeds, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, as after, I, I can't remember what I did in terms of mentioning him. And one of the questions I had from a student was, can you spell Stokely Carmichael? Because I'd like to be able to write it down. So in other words, there are generations of black students. This is a young black woman who have no idea who that is. So, and some of you may not in this no, audience. Could say a little bit about Kwame too, right? <laughs> he is a young, right? He's a young student from the Caribbean, born in Trinidad and Tobago, um, and or similarly migrates to the Bronx. Lives in a very small apartment um, with his family uh, in um, New York, and he has a really nice interview. You can find some of these things online, and also on uh, there's a nice. Um, Black Power Mixtape, have you all seen that? It was done by some Swedish journalists who had been documenting the Black Power movement. And they have him on that Black Power Mixtape interviewing his mother. Uh, the journalist wanted to interview his mother and she was not answering as, you know, an old, older black woman being, you know, demure and so on and not really giving. And he starts asking a series of questions. So tell us how you lived in the Bronx when you came to the Bronx. What was it like? Was your husband working? Did you work? An amazing series of questions that pulls out from her the difficulties of life of a Caribbean person migrating. And of course, Claudia Jones, if you, as you know, similarly would have that experience as a young black woman living, as a girl and as a young black woman living in the United States right after the, the so-called Harlem Renaissance and in the middle of the Great Depression. So he comes then as a young man to the Bronx, very, very smart, because he gets into the Bronx School of High School of Science, I think it's called, uh, and then goes to Howard University, but it's in the middle of civil rights period, um, and is becomes significantly involved then in the founding of SNCC, 
the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which has as its projects going to the South to get people to vote, working with people like Fannie Lou Hamer to have people vote. Because in the South then, and this is a question that is still current, keep mm -hmm. that in mind, eh? mm -hmm. because the question of voting um, and voter suppression in the United States is still a big one. But at that period, black people were not allowed to vote, they were asked, even though it had already um, been legalized. But in the South, you had a lot of crazy um, processes to de deny you the vote, like asking you to count how many bubbles in a bar of soap, and, I mean, all kinds of crazy things. So he was part of a group of students, abandoned their studies, actually, in a way, and went to deliberately work to open up the South. So people like, I have argued, people like Barack Obama is a direct benef beneficiary of that because to open it up and have people register to vote and then vote, that whole corridor that Obama is able to activate going through North Carolina, Georgia, and so on, these are places that people like Kwame Ture uh, would have worked hard to have people have the right to vote and to actually go down and vote and register and vote. Now, he eventually goes and lives in Guinea. He goes to Ghana. This is how he gets Kwame Ture from Kwame Nkrumah, and then Sekou Ture then ends up in, in Guinea. One of my former students is wor with working with his son to um, put together an exhibition of his work. And he's, he was in Guinea. Sekou Ture um, died many years ago. But he, and, and of course, Stokely died of cancer. Um, I forgot what year, but it would be in the 1990s. Um, but what really scared me was that all his papers are there in that room, and he kept sending me photographs. Like, this is what I'm seeing, magazines, everything. So Stokely stuff is needs Trinidad government mm -hmm. telling somebody who can help. Yeah. And the library needs to find a way to get that. Mm -hmm. He talks then about the question of diaspora for him, meaning is a way of surviving, it's survival. And he talks about the fact that he is pan-Caribbean, really. That technically, even though he's from Trinidad, although I was born in Trinidad in a real sense, it would be inaccurate to call me Trinidadian, um, pan-Caribbean. He talks about that, why that is the case. So I wanted just to close with another point, because although we're talking about women, um, the, my point about left intersections are still critical. Malcolm X, I claim, as a Caribbean radical intellectual. Um, why? Once I was listening to a man talk about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and he said Malcolm X was not quite the ideal black um, civil rights leader because he didn't belong to the black church <laughs> and he didn't belong to a frat and uh, three other things. Um, and, and it's an interesting point, but he, I think what he left out was that Malcolm X actually is, his mother was from the Caribbean, from Grenada, um, and he grew up with a father who was a Gaviite. So Malcolm X actually comes into black nationalism with a very specific orientation uh, that I think is informed by a kind of global international perspective. And I'm ending with this because I gave a talk in Canada and somebody brought me this photograph of Malcolm X. Um, he was in um, holding up Claudia Jones, the statement of the newspaper that shows Claudia Jones right after she died. He was in Oxford uh, to give a talk um, two weeks before he was killed. Um, and right in that in-between period, he went to Brixton and was walking. There were some race issues. And it was right around the time that Claudia Jones died. Claudia Jones died in um, Christmas Eve of 1964. And Malcolm X was killed like February something, 1965, 20th or something. I forgot the date. So essentially, you see a connection taking place. So my point then, what Caribbean left um, scholars um, and activists, radical intellectuals and activists, is that they, they embrace a range of positions that have to do with race, gender, class, um, definitely anti-imperialist, uh, anti-capitalist politics. And those are some of the strands that would be important for me. Uh, we can come back to that later. But I wanted to at least open uh, my part of the discussion with some of, this, some of these images and some of these materials.
Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, you know, they say that uh, repetition <laughs> is good for learning. <laughs> so, yes, okay. so don't be surprised if you see, hear some, and see some of the same things occurring once again. So what I try to do here is to look at some of the factors that I think would have given rise to early 20th century Caribbean left feminism. Then I focus on the very life, a very, what shall I say, suppressed version of Amy Ashwood Garvey. And then it, I just end with some other examples similar to, you see some of the same names turn up. Okay. Now, in examining the intricate linkage between feminism and early nationalism and internationalism, Kumari Jayawadina of Sri Lanka argues that the movement towards women's emancipation in Asia and the Middle East was acted out against a background of nationalist struggles aimed at achieving political independence, a certain national identity, and modernizing society. So it is in this context that I, in this presentation today, examine indigenous Caribbean feminisms that emerged from the racialized and colonial histories of Caribbean peoples, a feminism which was located in the ongoing struggles of its people at that time. Now, I think it's very important that when we look at early 20th century feminisms, we not judge them in relation to 21st century feminisms, although there are lots that are common, because the context there was sometimes quite different. But I think that what is important about these early 20th century feminisms is that many of them took the root of Pan-Africanism in a cultural nationalist sense, radical Pan-Africanism moving towards a more critical approach, or socialism, communism, or combinations of all of these in crafting their trajectory. Now, despite the colonial and the colonizing influences which affected these early women's organizations, these feminisms were a distinct response to the specific experiences of women in these colonizing and colonial environments. Now, Kumari Jayawadina, in her study on Asia and the Middle East, saw some of the factors that gave rise to those movements as the development of girls' education, the spread of Western secular thought, the wider context of resistance to imperialism, the expansion of capital and the emergence of a local bourgeoisie, the influence of the Irish struggle, very interesting, and male reformers who wish to conform to Western ideas of civilization. Now, in other presentations, I deal with male reformers of that period, who, some in the Pan-Africanist movement, who had fairly open and progressive ideas on women, but in today's presentation, I don't do that. So both in Asia and the African diaspora, these nationalist struggles and identity struggles that were taking place more broadly opened up spaces for women's consciousness and organizing and contributed to the growth of the early movement. And as we have seen from Carol's presentation, a lot of the activism by these early middle class and working class feminists was embedded within a concern for the social upliftment of their race and <laughs> nation, and of course, in this case, and for some of them, of their class. Now, Torres Salan, in his book An Intellectual History of the Caribbean, contends that as a region, the Caribbean, a different Created civilizational zone produced, of the, sorry, produced by the encounter of multiple cultures and by contending political and economic interests has produced an autonomous and vast body of knowledge about itself, a knowledge that is not implicitly expressed in Western chronicles of the movement of ideas, even when Western thinkers may have influenced particular cadres of Caribbean intellectuals.
So now this is what we're saying. And I think from what you have heard, there is a whole body of knowledge that is only slowly beginning to be recognized globally. And I think that goes not only for the Caribbean, but many other parts of the global south. So what were the factors that contribute to the emergence of the left tradition? As I mentioned before, there was the emergence of the middle class education, po educated population that was well read. I think that was really interesting, especially when I consider my students today. You know, we recently saw a, a movie on C.L.R. James and the extent to which he had read international readings, local readings, was really amazing. And I think that that was something that really contributed. The fact that racism, colorism, and poverty, legacies of the system of enslavement and bonded labor, continued. And you have to understand that by the 1920s, slavery had not been abolished yet 100 years. So this was a very recent. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 presented a sense of hope to many oppressed peoples throughout the world, and even though it might be hard for us to think so, and therefore you saw the more informal as well as structured spread of socialist and communist ideas worldwide. And then you had the actual work of the Communist International through its Caribbean office in New York, but also offices here in Hamburg and in the Soviet Union which became sites for recruiting and training young Caribbean, but primarily male intellectuals from more language areas of the region. For the most part, in the Caribbean, women were not part of the Comintern's focus. Many of these women, including those who joined the Communist Party, came to this understanding largely on their own through interaction with other communists. In the US, Eric McDuffie documents success of black women members of the Communist Party of the USA, Workers' Party, and the Socialist Party in mobilizing working class women, for example, in Harlem. And many of these women of these parties, for, for example, the black woman, Bonita Williams, Grace Campbell, and Claudia Jones, had Caribbean roots. At the same time, these women sought to bring issues of women and issues of black women more centrally into the Communist Party agendas. So it has been left there for the feminist scholars to bring to public attention the work, activism, and literary contributions of the 20th century Pan-Africanist and radical feminist thinkers and activists. So this afternoon, I present primarily on the work of Amy Ashwood Garvey, radical Pan-Africanist and first wife of Marcus Garvey, with brief reference to three others, Una Marson, Claudia Jones, who I really don't need to right now, and Hermina Dubont also. Now, the United Negro Improvement Association, or the UNIA, was probably the most important, successful, and internationalist Pan-Africanist organization of all times. <coughs> its membership spanned North, South, Central America, and the Caribbean, with influences as far as Southern Africa. Like many nationalist organizations, it was organized around a discourse of manhood, in this case shaped a lot by Booker T. Washington's ideology of black self-reliance. As noted by Barbara Baer, who is a Gavi historian, this self-made construction of manhood was translated in the movement into a petty bourgeois ideal with the ideas of the nuclear family and of a sexual division of labor in which women's roles were largely privatized. Yet, despite this overarching patriarchal ideology, Bear refers to a dual sex structure of the UNIA, which provided space for women's organization within it and awakened their consciousness and public activism. Now that dual sex structure was introduced by Amy Ashwood Garvey, who actually was one of the co-founders of the Garvey movement in 1914. She was age 17, and I think Garvey was about 10 or, yeah, he was at least 26, so he was at least 10 years older. And Amy insisted on having these parallel leadership positions. So for example, you have a lady vice president as well as a male vice president. You might have a lady something. So within the 
central committee or executive or whatever you call that body, there would always be women present. And McDuffie argues that was one of the weaknesses of the Communist Party, that in most instances there would be no women at all in the central organizing body. Amy and her family members were heavily involved in the organization of many of the early activities. That's because Amy's family had a little bit of money. And even though they disapproved of Amy's relationship, they got involved. It, in fact, the first at headquarters was her family's house. And she also started the ladies' division of the UNIA, which later became their version of the Red Cross, the Black Cross nurses. Um, so there's an older picture of Amy, and this is a card from Marcus Garvey. There's a very romantic story about how they met, but if we have time at I the know, end, I, I can it. give it to you. Yeah. So about the end of our... Uh, Amy's family actually got a bit worried about the relationship, and they sent Amy off to Panama for two years. But they corresponded, and Robert Hill has a full compendium of the letters. But in 1919, Amy joined Marcus in Harlem, New York. She became General Secretary of the UNA, Secretary of the Ladies Division, New York Local, and assisted Marcus in fundraising. That year, they began producing the Negro World, which was a periodical, weekly periodical, that circulated throughout the African diaspora. Uh, and she would also sp speak on street corners like Garvey and other members are uh, trying to impress upon blacks in the U.S. the idea of an imagined homeland in Africa and its relationship to the improvement. So that is there the masthead of the Negro world and one of the articles, Africa, the land of hope and promise for Negro peoples of the world. And, uh, but in addition, like all the work of the UNIA, the arts, literature, were always included. Moving quickly along, from very early, Marcus and Amy were under continuous surveillance by the U.S. District Attorney, and Amy was summoned up to 17 times. She reported, I was summoned to the same District Attorney's office, and on each occasion, I had to go through the same wearisome procedure. Strange to relate, no other officer from the UNIA, not even Marcus Garvey, was questioned by the police at that time. Years later, in 1944, when she would write the U.S. Vice Consul in Kingston about jobs for Jamaican domestics, what happened, the U.S. had an emergency farm labor scheme after the war, where male Jamaicans would go to the U.S., uh, work on the farms, get money, and return home. And Amy complained that women didn't have that position. So she was petitioning for women to be able to go up as domestics as part of the farm labor scheme. However, no less a person than J. Edgar Hoover, of the head of the FBI, an architect of a lot of the mm -hmm. suppression during that era, mm -hmm. would advise the State Department not to approve this request because of her links with Marcus Garvey and the UNA and the fear that this success would strengthen her influence. Now, after all these years of relationship and communication and working together, Marcus Garvey and Amy Ashwood Garvey got married, I believe, in 1920 or 21. Anyway, the marriage lasted a month, and then Marcus divorced her, although Amy never acknowledged the divorce. Anyway, think she ever signed this. yes, she never signed the papers. What was interesting is that Marcus <laughs> then immediately remarried one of Amy's best friends, the maid of honor, the matron of maid of honor at her wedding. That was second Amy, Amy Jakes Garvey, who became a strong supporter of Marcus Garvey for the rest of his life. So we leave the did you gossip for another <laughs> time? <laughs> anyway, very good. so after the divorce from Marcus. Amy embarked on a new life. As Carol pointed out, she traveled to Montreal, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, London, throughout Europe, back to New York in 1924, where she produced three plays, and then finally to London in 1930. 
it is beyond me how these people got the money how they traveled but to me they lived on their wits they survived but they were able to do so much uh, with the little that they had but when she moved to London she opened a business a restaurant and something called a social parlor which turned out to be a key meeting point for Caribbean and African intellectuals and socialist oriented West Indians and Africans so some of the people who used to hang out in her parlor and club were C.L.R. James, George Padmore, who by that who had then worked for the Comintern and the International uh, Red of Inter International Organization of Negro Workers, Una Marson, Ras McConnell, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, among others. Now, one of the big activities that engaged them was the 1935 fascist invasion of Ethiopia by Mussolini. And Carol is right, there were these two events that circulated throughout the region and in the north that mobilized these people. One was the Scottsboro Boys issue, the other was the 1935 invasion of Ethiopia by Mussolini. I remember my mother telling me about it because she was telling me that the people in Trinidad were so angry that for the first time the Catholic Church Bazaar made no money because people were protesting the fact that the Pope blessed the troops to go to Ethiopia so they did not support the church's activities that year. So in London, Amy was part of a solidarity organization formed entitled the International African Friends of Ethiopia which was formed in her restaurant and she became a central figure speaking in Labour Party and at the Communist League Against Imperialism on the issue of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia uh, and it is said that some of the other people were of course George Padmore, Sierra James but she took on in a way the leadership of this organization which after the invasion changed to become the International African Service Bureau. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing now is Amy's consciousness is shifting from the kind of cultural nationalist, simply anti-racist approach of Marcus Garvey to one that is more nuanced with social class, with anti-imperialism and understanding in a slightly more socialist oriented way. So therefore, she was one of the organizers of the historic Pan-African Congress held in Manchester in 1945, which was the most influential of all Pan-African consciousness congresses. And in fact, many of the future leaders of Africa were present, as well as many of the leading thinkers of the time. The organizing team were Amy Ashford Garvey, Sierra James, George Padmore and Kwame Nkrumah. So often you see people speak about the organization of that and do not mention Amy Ashwood Garvey. Uh, but the participants included, active, included, for example, of course, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Peter Abrahams, W.E. Du Bois, who was invited to attend. And Amy chaired the first session entitled The Color Problem in Britain. And this is her, I couldn't get a stronger picture there, this is her giving her opening speech which I think is very historic because women would usually not get that kind of position. And someone who was there reported, the chairman for this occasion was Mrs. Amy Garvey, wife of Mr. Marcus. She always carried herself as the mm. wife of Marcus mm. <laughs> <laughs> And she opened the meeting with a mature and balanced speech touching on freedom and humanity. Soldiers of the Commonwealth and others had fought and sacrificed their lives to this end. And freedom and peace should be the price to be won, etc. She asked for freedom and self-rule for British colonies. She referred to racial discrimination and other prejudices, etc. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't have that music. Yeah. Now, yeah. interestingly, at this big conference, Congress, there were only two women who were actual presenters and there were two Jamaican women and on the day that the sessions on the Caribbean took place they spoke and the sessions on the Caribbean were the only sessions that mentioned women's issues mm 
They spoke about issues of equal pay for equal work. They spoke about issues of racism and colorism, education for women, and Amy began with this. Very much has been written and spoken of the Negro, but for some reason, very little has been said about the black woman. She has been shunted into the social background to be a child bearer. This has principally been her lot. And well, I don't have time. Mm -hmm. So when the report was written, the only section that had recommendations related to women were those on the Caribbean or the West Indies because of the presence of these two women. Now, there, a lot happens, but Amy, of course, always had a love for Africa. There she is, resplendent in a Kente cloth. I can't imagine how much that cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1946, she embarked on a three-and-a-half-year West African tour. That's how they operated. She And during her tour, she said she was researching women. Mm -hmm. She would go to communities, interview women, she write down notes. She would speak to them. She said she tried to raise their consciousness. She organized women's organizations, not sure how they lasted. And she visited, she went from Liverpool to Senegal to Sierra Leone to Liberia, returned to Sierra Leone to Ghana, Chad, Togo, Cameroons, Nigeria, Gambia, Senegal, Dahomey. Oh, she amazing. also visited Spanish Guinea, sections of French Equatorial Africa. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> and she identified as one of her main tasks to investigate the conditions facing Africa, African women, and where possible, exert whatever influence she could to improve their lot. Now, one of the she spent a long time in Liberia, and she wrote a pamphlet called Liberia: Land of Promise. I don't know if people know that Liberia, which is still a country in Africa, was settled by by freed slaves from the U.S. who went back to Liberia. Of course, there were native people there, and that has always been a source of conflict. But Liberia was an attempt to form like a new free uh, republic on the continent. So people had a lot of like good hopes for Liberia. So she went there, and she spent quite a long time, and she wrote this pamphlet, Liberia, Land of Promise, which... She took back to England to be edited and retyped, but it was never published. Mm -hmm. Sylvia Pankers, however, wrote a preview mm -hmm. which summarized the contents, and that was published okay. in Trinidad <laughs> during her visit in 1953. Oh, okay. So actually, I was very disappointed, but that's one of the problems with Amy Ashwood. She has tons of unfinished manuscripts, yeah. Yeah. including her own biography. Mm -hmm. Now, she returns to England. She continues to be active. And then by 1969, she's back in Harlem. Apparently, she was there during, the, I think she supported the campaign of Adam Clayton Powell at the time. And I think she died that same year, or one year after. So here's the same picture of Claudia Jones, P Paul Robeson, who was my mother's favorite baritone, <laughs> Amy Ashwood, I think this is Paul Robeson. Islander Good Robeson. That's his wife and others. And the mayor of mayor Kensington of or one of those. Right. And his wife. So just quickly, this is Una Marson, playwright, poet, journalist, secretary of the League of Colored Peoples in London, collaborated with women's organizations. She got a League of Nations fellowship where she met Sylvia Pankers. You know, Sylvia Pankers turns up in mm -hmm. so many connections mm -hmm. with these Caribbean activists that I think maybe somebody, somebody should do a little that. essay Absolutely. on that. And um, she was also secretary to Haile Selassie during the time of the Abyssinian invasion, and she supported him. She went with him to the League of Nations to plead the case of the Abyssinians. As you heard later, she would work with the BBC with the program. Well, you've heard about Claudia Jones, and then her main, her Mina DuPont Heiswood, who worked as secretary to the NAACP in Harlem. She was born in Guyana. She joined the CPUSA, was active in international communist activities with Grace Campbell and others. She was one of the women fighting for greater rights for women within the U.S. Workers' Party. Now, she was one of the few of these women who married. And it's interesting, you never see a picture of her without her husband. And uh, she's described by McDuffie as one of the black left feminists of the CPUSA. Conclusion. Now, there's a lot that was common with these women and 
other left feminist women who we do not discuss here. First of all, they were mainly middle class for that time and beneficiaries of sound colonial education. It's interesting if even they didn't go to high school or university, the quality of the colonial education at that time was quite strong. Their lives reflected the intersectionalities of race, class, and gender. And with the exception of Hermina Heiswood, that should be H-U-I, where marriages were entered into were brief, yet their personal trajectories and intimacies were deeply entangled with their feminist and pan-Africanist politics. Unmarried liaisons, where they did occur, appeared to be more long-lasting, although they apparently also came to an end. This suggests that the mobility and personal space required for such activism could not be combined with traditional marriage. They had in internationalist and regional visions. Their anti-racist concerns did not preclude them making strategic alliances and friendships with women of other ethnicities and nationalities, especially those who shared their concern. An involvement in these movements created a consciousness and imagination which allowed women to go beyond the parameters of these movements, to challenge patriarchal constructs as they understood them, both in their personal and public lives, as well as in their artistic and literary production. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction and this very rich intellectual history that we know very little about here. And so it's, uh, I think that there might be a lot of questions, but let's, yeah, the one of you that like to leave the room, please take the chance <coughs> now to do so. Wenn Sie den Raum verlassen wollen, können Sie das jetzt machen? Okay. Um, I would suggest that we first collect some questions before we start our dialogue. Yeah. <coughs> because there might be, I know it's a lot, we've been uh, in the class uh, working on Claudia Jones and in your class you Come work with some of the authors, yes. but I think that they're part of a history that we don't get to know here, mm. um, that even <coughs> our attempt to understand black feminism very much departs from the United States and what mm. you show is actually that a lot of the feminists that have been very key, also Audre Lorde, for example, mm -hmm. in yeah. Germany, mm -hmm. um, for the, bla uh, for the black the feminist same. German for movement sure. also, and the work she did here in Berlin and in other parts, and she was also a Caribbean. Yeah, uh, her mother's from Grenada. <coughs> Grenada activist. So, and so it's quite interesting <coughs> to see how how prominent it is and also the how rich it is, the analysis Mm -hmm. and uh, intellectual traditions. Uh, but there might be some questions. Vielleicht haben Sie Fragen, die Sie auch auf Deutsch stellen wollen. Uh, wir können das gerne übersetzen. Please, go ahead. Do you have a question? Ach so. <laughs> 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 yeah, bitte. Sorry. Yes, yes. somebody. Yeah. I'm wondering about the connection between the Friend, the Francophone Caribbean and the Anglophone Caribbean. Because I remember a Canadian historian talking about the Haiti, with uh, people from Haiti coming to Quebec and uh, bringing actually the, the understanding of the, the uh, anti colonial struggle to Canada, which then went from Quebec, French speaking Quebec, to the English speaking working unions. And, and so that's very interesting to see that. And, um, I wonder how that is connected. Could we collect? Yeah. yeah that's mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, French. would you say your name? And oh, my oh. name is um, <coughs> Angela Weber, and I'm, uh, well, I study cultural anthropology, and I did a PhD on um, ca a Canadian artist course and indigenous positions in the artist courses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, are there other questions? Yeah, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Ms. Uh, Service. Um, you talked about uh, uh, sitting in prison in a year and a day, and you, you kind of left us hanging there. <laughs> uh, I would want to know what you mean. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. So, are there other questions? Please. A um, question to you, Professor Birthday, as well. Um, you talk about um, Caribbean spaces and the circulation of intellectuals. 
And I was wondering what your thoughts are on um, the circulation of knowledge mm -hmm. in that regard, especially if there are traces of knowledge mm -hmm. left in those spaces where the intellectuals went, mm -hmm. or if they took it with them, so to say, mm -hmm. to the next space, and um, ah, or cool. if um, people um, interacting with those scholars took up their ideas, if there's like, um, I don't know, a community um, created by them. So mm -hmm. it was just Sorry, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Lea Hilson. We've actually met in Haiti at the CSA. Oh, cool. You probably won't remember me, but... <laughs> I, I thought you uh, seemed familiar, but yeah, I didn't know where. I meant to talk about um, Winter yeah. and Jones and um, Barry Gilroy and how they interacted ah, nice, and how nice, their nice. critique okay. of humanism yeah. um, shows parallel, sure. parallels mm -hmm. and contradictions. So, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, would you also like to say anything? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Jonas Kulaya. I'm studying uh, social sciences in the first semester. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. I shall introduce. <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Sebastian Gabel. I work at the Institute of Sociology um, with Professor Gutierrez. Uh, thanks, first of all, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, I was wondering about the uh, the fact that I mean, all the the, the, uh, the women you presented, not only mm -hmm. intellectuals but uh, but activists, so even mm -hmm. like politically engaged. Mm -hmm. and um, maybe you can say, I was wondering about what, uh, mm. how would you describe their relationship or how they would would see uh, mm. the necessity of um, of state building in general, their relation mm. to the state. I mean, it's, it's mm. uh, they, you all define them as, as Marxist, right? Mm. And this has been, uh, until their day, still some kind of unfinished project mm. of Marx mm. himself, mm. right? So, and in Europe, it began mm -hmm. with, with Gramsci, the relationship to uh, to see a more mm -hmm. dynamic mm -hmm. approach to mm -hmm. see the state. And I was, um, mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting to see um, uh, Amy Ashwood Garvey writing about Liberia, you know, as this kind of um, <laughs> utopian state, mm -hmm. even. So maybe it can give us give us some insights, even about uh, thinking uh, collective organization. Uh, Organization of some kind of states in mm -hmm. in contrast to the uh, European racist uh, mm -hmm. uh, racist states. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we we will collect later on mm -hmm. again. Okay. okay. Um, the French um, connections. Um, this really uh, this is work that is still taking place. Um, women of negritude, particularly following the Fanon that horrible fun on critique of women, you know, mm -hmm. that he has in, in Black Skin, White Masks. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. I think there's the, the studies and the scholarship on that is still unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because a young woman named Maria <coughs> Moise from Martinique uh, just mm -hmm. wrote a little piece where she critiques mm -hmm. the fact that whenever people talk about negritude, mm -hmm. for example, the, you still talk about the three Man. Founders, mm. <laughs> um, Leon Damas, Sen Senghor, and Cesar. I, I have to mm. disclose I was mm. a student of Leon Damas mm. when he was at Howard. He was my thesis, one of my thesis advisors. Um, mm. um, but but the sense of where women fit into that was not addressed. According to Miriam's work, and I haven't studied it enough to mm. give you a really really good. Uh, answer, but according to Miriam, <coughs> thinking through this, the Nadal sisters mm -hmm. are really critical. One has to, and there should be mm -hmm. more work on them, because yes. they technically mm -hmm. had a salon before all of the mm -hmm. the male activity, in which people came to discuss some of these ideas, mm -hmm. and in which they they had opportunities for those kinds of engagements on the questions of, you know, deracination, mm -hmm. which was of course fundamental to French colonialism. And of course, how people mm -hmm. like Damas and the others begin to articulate it later, each of each in his own mm -hmm. way, is really an important mm -hmm. discussion anyway within the negritude mm -hmm. discussion of negritude. And of course, she mentions Suzanne Cesaire, the wife of of Cesaire, who ne doesn't get enough mm -hmm. attention as well. So I I mm -hmm. want to encourage people, and like mm -hmm. you for sure, if you're doing that kind of work, that this is an area that all of these areas actually mm -hmm. we have I have to mm -hmm. say. Uh, each strand is a piece that can mm -hmm. feel the whole mm -hmm. dissertation project. Each of those. That that and I was listening to Dr. Reddock and there's something she said that I I'm mean, wow, like, that's something that somebody needs to really work on. Um definitely the Amy mm -hmm. and Liberia point. Mm -hmm. I mean that's another you wanna add something to that? Go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that in these centers of power, <coughs> like the United States and London, I think that is where you would have met sometimes, like the more United States, you might get some Francophone people there. Certainly that was where uh, Hermina Dumont, who was from British Guyana, yeah. would, met Otto, would meet Otto Heisford, who was from Suriname, at that time called Dutch Guyana. So I think that the migrations from the region to New York City, the Bronx, Brooklyn, etc., was also a place where you had a lot of these connections. There's a guy called Barry Carr who has an article called Across the Seas, and he speaks about that period in the 20s when there are all of these Central Americans, Caribbeans, Haitians, and whatever, who are meeting in New York and working within Central America and the region. And it's very interesting because, of course, at some point <coughs> in the 1920s, the common turn is also a link with all these people from different parts of the region. So I think certainly the, the centers would have been the places where these people would meet. <coughs> OK. There, there's a <coughs> woman, Tracy Deneen Sharpley Whiting, who did a book on women of a woman of negritude? Or I forgot how it's mm. titled, but she's somebody that you may want to identify. Mm. A year and a day, I gather that was the sen sentencing format they would use to ensure that you didn't get certain kinds of rights. <laughs> so, like, why would you give you a year mm. and a day, right? So, the, when the people were fighting mm. to get Claudia released, they had to be pushing against that. Um, yeah, so it is, it's, it's something as diabolical as that. Um, so I think circulation of knowledge uh, and communities, I think that's a really great question because consistently we have um, each of mm -hmm. them, uh, the Una Marston is an ex probably the best example because then she goes on, of course she writes, I have a student working mm -hmm. on, on her, Emma, Emma Kyoko um, as well, and I, the essay you mentioned, uh, is an essay or book on Una Massa in any book? Weird. Well, there's a, n a new essay, but there's a book some years ago. Yeah, by ja Jared. Yeah, but there's Jared a new Macaulay. essay by Umarang. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. But Una Massa, she interestingly <coughs> writes, and this this is before <coughs> the so-called black power and the <coughs> question of black aesthetic. She writes about black hair, black kinky hair, hair blues, kinky hair blues. And she talks <coughs> about she was somebody who resisted <coughs> the the pressures for women at that time to perm and all that. Mm -hmm. So this is before um, mm -hmm. that time. Um, so she, she was mm -hmm. really on to the question of the aesthetic representations of black women before it becomes mm -hmm. really popularly articulated. Um, so in terms of residual questions that have to do with knowledge later on, I would see mm -hmm. her having a major impact as far as that is concerned. Mm -hmm. She also somebody I gather who struggled and mm -hmm. from the work the book and the essays with mental illness as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. which is another interesting point um, yeah. about her. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. her work with the Pan Africanist organizations and with Heidi Selassie mm -hmm. is, of course, mm -hmm. fundamental. Uh, but Claudia is mm -hmm. probably, I saw like Una Marson, mm -hmm. another version because creating the West Indian Gazette mm -hmm. and Afro Asian Caribbean News, it started <coughs> as West Indian Gazette and then it adds that Afro Asian Caribbean News part of it. She then influences mm -hmm. or has that way of creating a, a, a medium um, that then, if it's identified as the first black newspaper in England, you can see then the subsequent development of journalism mm -hmm. as well. And she had journalist training, so she was able to do that mm -hmm. very easily. Mm -hmm. um, I was told too, you were talking about this, do things carry over? Mm -hmm. All the people I interviewed said that Claudia was the kind, because she spent all those years mm -hmm. in Harlem, when she got to London and the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you know, migrants, if you were called, um, were still struggling. She was the kind of, mm -hmm. she didn't buy any of that. She she didn't wait for no bus. She took a taxi if she needed to go somewhere. And um, she moved, they said, with a kind of very New York style. She smoked. <laughs> it's not a good thing now, but back <laughs> then women who did that publicly were quite <laughs> considered a certain kind of, you know, commanding of space and so on. So she um, and did not accept. Um, there's a nice clip that you can find online. 
um, where she's interviewed the, uh, on the BBC, where she's talking about the color bar in London, and she's bringing exactly the same um, questions that were raised in the U.S. as far as the Smith Act and the Walter McCarran Act, and how still the question of immigration mm -hmm. is still part of, of U.S. national mm -hmm. anxiety, heightened whenever mm -hmm. they need to do it for whatever reasons, uh, heightened, of course, in this last election and so on, the so-called caravans <coughs> and their migrations north and all the discussions around that. Mm -hmm. But she brings then that knowledge of struggle how to move, how to organize a community, what to do mm -hmm. um, from her work with the Communist Party, her journalism, mm -hmm. and then the activist work that she mm -hmm. did uh, in um, Harlem, into London. I gather she helped people with housing. I mean, she helped people because back then for Caribbeans in London, getting mm -hmm. um, ability to find adequate housing or to find work was a big problem. Mm -hmm. So she brings all of those skills that she has from organizing. And I argue in Left of Karl Marx that when she gets mm -hmm. to London, she switches completely, I think, from a full association with the Communist Party into a much more global mm -hmm. Pan-African. She doesn't have that as much earlier. Although when she did say, and I, I, the connection Dr. Redock makes with the I, the international, whatever, I forgot, yeah. the initials. IFE. IFE, <coughs> where she says that I got information about Mussolini and so on. I think that trace is coming from those people, yes, here, yeah. in the James and those yeah, guys, yeah. Um, and, and also Amy Ashwood Garvey. So I, uh, <coughs> what I'm finding, yes, uh, at, the, at the level of knowledge, <coughs> a series of exchanges, <coughs> sharings, definitely residuals, <coughs> definitely influences, Definitely skills mm. about how to organize, mm. how to um, uh, how to help community, and mm. how to link actual mm. social cultural interaction with a politics that could mm. be transformative. And this is where the carnival has that impact. Mm. And that's a whole other debate because when she there's a nice film uh, called A Rock in Water, a play, and then became a film, documented film, um, where she is struggling with the with her. <laughs> Uh, left or um, left male Caribbean uh, friends and colleagues because they're saying a carnival is like a waste of time. Um, why you want to support something like that? And she is arguing, and and the quote from her is a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. That it is in culture precisely where one is able to have a people then contribute their knowledge, their ability to to transform society in ways that they were not being allowed in this sort of cold-hearted, gray London. So today when you go to England, mm -hmm. I mean, this is the Stuart Hall's point, the diet has shifted completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of British food and what it used to be. You don't, you all are too young. But back then I was, we were talking about this recently. What was British food? You know, but Overcooked now you <laughs> greens, <laughs> potatoes and something, and, and no seasoning. Murdered greens. But good puddings. But good puddings. Good puddings. So <laughs> the, 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 the cuisine and the culture of London <laughs> today is totally influenced by uh, the Caribbean um, <coughs> influence and <coughs> the Indian and, the a and a range of other Asian influences that, that you see running around. So that <laughs> aspect of knowledge, I think, is also important. And, and people talk about that, the Salvans, you know, lonely Londoners, that it was Caribbean women going down to those grocers and saying, you need to bring this. <laughs> I need ginger. I need this. So that when you walk through those markets, now I always marvel. You see all kinds of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. from all over the world. But according to Selvan and the others, that was not there before. This is coming when the Caribbean women in particular come with their men or come after or without and then demand the kinds of things that could advance their their cuisine and so on. Mm -hmm. And then the state building, you can have yeah, it better I than want, I yeah, can. Yeah, I, I wanted can. to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, in the Gavi movement, Gavi's approach was Africa for the Africans. Mm -hmm. His approach was that Africans had been, like, exiled in the West, and they needed to go back to reclaim Africa. He also had a very strange view that the because of the Africans who were in the West, were probably a bit more civilized. You know, he had a, there were sometimes these mm. strange feelings. He felt that they could go and help, you know, to build Africa as well. Well, by the time 
Amy got more involved in London and actually began to meet real Africans because the thing is, Gavi was speaking, but he had never really met maybe a few in the US. But certainly with Amy having to meet Kenyatta and 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 Kuma and, Dan and, Dan, and Dan all Dan of these Dan. real Africans mm -hmm. have a position shifted. She said, well, you know, really and truly, these Africans have their own business. I don't think they really want us going there to tell them what to do. And basically, because the, the inf even though she continued, because it was after that she still went and traveled for four years in Africa, the issue then became self-government. And that's why that fourth Pan-African Congress, the important thing was self-government for all these British colonies because British had Britain had all of these colonies. And the whole question of internal self-government and autonomy over the countries was very important. And I, so there you see the interest has moved from simply like anti-racism to a larger anti- and decolonization impetus. I think what is also interesting about Amy is that she is credited with forming an organization called the, the Nigerian Progress Union. She apparently saw, heard about somebody, a young scholar, Lapido, some, I can't remember his name. Yeah, she calls him up, they meet, and they decide to form this Nigeria Progress Union, which eventually becomes morphs into a larger organization called the West African Students Union. And a lot of these potential West African political leaders are members of this organization. So when Amy store in Africa, you know, she has these friends in all these places <laughs> where she's going. These these men who used to be in London, some of them who were members of the West African Students Union or who she had met in her political work or in her social parlor, etc. So the whole question of decolonization, self-government, independence, was something that they were certainly beginning to grapple with at that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we do a second round. It's the mm -hmm. last round mm -hmm. because time is quite advanced yes, already. Somebody over there. So there was one pr uh, here. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> He's an. <laughs> He's He didn't person. like to make <laughs> to <draw> some attention. <laughs> so bye. <laughs> Sorry, there's one. Um, by introducing me. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm Chichek. I run 
Zortikas uh, uh, in PDFCT organizing the, for the organization of the events and I'm also a PhD student here at Human Sociology. Um, I wanted to ask particularly about your experiences as feminists and as researchers who dig into these biographies and histories. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically because I come from a place where these histories were completely forgotten, um, that the whole national history was rewritten as one man saving all nations, <laughs> therefore as especially the women of the, uh, that nation. And it took years and decades for feminists in Turkey to rediscover the Ottoman feminism, mm -hmm. which was uh, Ottoman feminism left and socialist feminism especially. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really strong when you look when we look back at in the history. Um, but they were written, and as you also mentioned, the history is written as uh, it is all done by men, mostly, willingly or unwillingly, for example, having pictures with husbands always, <laughs> or uh, considering oneself as the legitimate wife still, kind of. <laughs> um, so, and also when we look at the academia, there's already a cut between black feminism and uh, intersectional intersectionality, for example. So, like, I don't know mm. to what extent these cuts were there and what were your mm. experiences mm. in beginning to mm. back into these biographies. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Is there another one there? No, no. You're just <laughs> <Question, laughs> leaning uh, back. Okay. Well, mm. thank you. You want to start with that? Okay, the first one, is it the relevance for trans? How is the knowledge relevant? Yeah. yeah. Now, I personally think this knowledge is very relevant and um, <coughs> in a way that links up with your question about uh, our experiences as researchers and activists in restructuring these histories. Because I grew up at a time when we were told that feminism was a luxury for rich white women in the North and was a luxury that we in the third world could not afford because our priority was bread and putting food on the table. And at the time, I knew nothing of these histories or other history that I know now. But I think that I was determined because I felt that, that no group that is ever oppressed or subordinated does not resist, so that there must be a history here and that's why even though I'm a, in fact what is interesting is that our country is one of the few countries in the world where we don't teach our history in schools. Trinidad and Tobago history is not taught in schools and even though some people like I did a general West Indian history the Trinidad and Tobago part of it which is quite different from the rest of the region is not given much attention. So you have a whole country where most people don't know it's most crazy. of the history. So I think that is part of our, um, that's one of our problems, which of course we need to fix. So for me, the, the, the discovery of these histories was very personally empowering. And doing this work and spreading this work locally and in the region, I think continues to be empowering, but I do feel that we still need to do more. I think we need to do more also in terms of um, po in popular culture, more in terms of movies, documentaries, <coughs> uh, television, etc. Because recently there was a, we have a film festival and the film that was the opening night, the big film, was a film about a black Trinidadian man who worked in London and got involved in the Pan-Africanist struggle. Well, most of the Trinidadians didn't even know there was a Pan-Africanist struggle. And they mentioned George Padma, and people were so amazed. They were so enamored with George Padma. But what upset me is that there was a, a scene of that same radio program called in the West Indies. And instead of having somebody representing Una Marson, they had C.L.R. James doing the interview. And I said, you know, that is so horrible. 
And then there was a scene of the Fifth Pan-African Congress, and there was no mention of Amy Ashford Garvey. So I went up to the filmmaker after and complained about Amy Ashford Garvey, but that it's only later I said, but also, <coughs> they didn't portray you in a mass. And so I was just thinking, you know, I must really write her. Because I cannot understand how people would consciously change history in order, I do not, maybe to make the story more interesting or something like that. But that really, so I think that these histories are, in, are, are amazingly important, but we have to do much more work in popularizing them. With regard to the Women's International Democratic Federation, that's really a good project, mm -hmm. and uh, I wish I was doing it myself. But, uh, there, I mean, up to when I was younger, that organization was still quite active. We used to get the magazines in Trinidad, and uh, a lot of people went to meetings in Moscow and different Cuba and different parts of the world through that organization. So, like Hermina and some of these other women would have been members of that organization. But what strikes me is Christina Lois, who's a woman I didn't mention. She was a Trinidadian feminist and socialist. And there's, there's a great photo of her that I have in Moscow with all the other women at the in Women's International Democratic Federation uh, having a toast for something or the other. So that was clearly what was also important about these communist uh, organizations. They were the ones that celebrated International Women's Day, mm -hmm. you know. So Christina Lois brought, she introduced the celebration of International Women's Day into Trinidad in 1953. And I think it had a lot to do with her experience in the WIDF and those connections with socialist organizations. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And um, I she, met, she met Claudia, right, Christine? She would have met. Possibly, Possibly, yes, yes, yes. There, she was. I think she was in London at one time. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, the fortunately or unfortunately for us, um, but fortunate I should say, um, because Africana studies in the U.S. got institutionalized. There's more opportunity now to do that. But for teaching, many of us had to, and I mean the, that history is well documented from the U.S. Black feminists. But some of us are brave and so on. Barbara Smith and that group. To, to find ways to make sure that um, the, the, the knowledge that was coming out of um, African American women's lives got to be in, you know, in, in, yeah, institutionalized. So I think almost every university now mm -hmm. has a course on black women, black women's his, in history department, usually history and English department. Um, sociology, not so much, interestingly. Economics, not. Political science, no. In fact, I'm t I teach a course called Black Women in Political Leadership, and the Political Science Department um, cross-listed, and students take it because they don't have that course in their department. So, you know, on the one hand, you have these opportunities because of the structures of black studies, but you also still have women having to push for them to be included or, or taught. Um, um, I, I think it's Elaine Brown uh, who was chairperson of the Black Panther Party, the last person, and she mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Taste of Power. She mm -hmm. was critical of Black Lives Matter for that reason. She felt that they did not. Well, I think the critique is that they tend to be too much mm -hmm. online, the organizing, mm -hmm. that it's more about posting, <coughs> and Instagramming, and Twittering <laughs> than it is about organizing, and they organize events, but then, and these are circulated online, but then they, there seems to be no follow-up for community. So Elaine Brown had a critique, which some people also critique because they felt that since she had all this experience from the Black Panther Party, that she mm -hmm. probably should work with them as opposed to critiquing them in that way. So that's, I mean, we can look at it both ways. So, yeah, Black Lives Matter. I don't know how much they do know. There's a young woman who, who has a, again, She's identified as prison culture, and I, she came to give a talk. She is a Black Lives Matter organizer from Chicago, mm -hmm. person, and I, I, she gave a talk in Ithaca mm -hmm. College, which is in the Ithaca community, and I was in the audience. And later, when I told her who I was, she was like, "Oh my God, Claudia Jones!" She was so excited. So she said, "This is one of the books that I read." So I don't know if how <laughs> much they, you know, how much the the practice or mm -hmm. praxis, right, of a Claudia Jones and so on, uh, is impacting. 
However, they have something that they call radical self-care as part of their framework. And they really fight for that in terms of Black Lives Matter. They, and they talk about that because they felt that that mm -hmm. earlier generation precisely died too early because they didn't mm -hmm. take care of themselves. And we can look at that mm -hmm. from multiple ways. I just did a Walter Rodney lecture. And that's a debate that mm -hmm. James even had about Rodney afterwards. To what extent does that intellectual activist work then becomes so much outside of the intellectual mm -hmm. field that it can lead to you being, you know, wiped out. So Claudia, from mm -hmm. all accounts, had a heart condition, but she never stopped. She smoked, mm -hmm. as I said, um, and she was always going, going, going. So the, that's a whole other question, mm -hmm. and and we also, I think, in contemporary society, now have to think about ourselves mm -hmm. as well and how much we give to these struggles. Now, the other mm -hmm. fascinating thing about them and the question of self-care and relationships. <laughs> the <coughs> Many of them, like, for example, um, Amy, according to Tony Martin, <laughs> um, had a relationship with Tubman, who was the president of Liberia. So she, she was able, mm -hmm. and he funded a lot of things, it seems, like the paper and stuff like that. And according to Martin, when she was, she was very ill towards the end of her, her life, you know, she was reaching out to him and he wanted to help at the distance and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So they didn't, often they were not monogamous. Right? That's the best way mm -hmm. to frame it. <laughs> 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 they had relationships um, and affairs. Uh, so they, I, you know, some of them were not monogamous. But they had no children. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the other thing. Because it's, you know, I don't know. But Claudia was married, but I, I was told it was like a, a kind of communist marriage that lasted a few years. To and, and to a Jewish Jewish communist member, it seems. So um, I think it's a question that we should still keep alive. You know, the extent to which mm -hmm. activist work then um, sometimes means that that one's personal life is neglected, mm -hmm. or the extent to which one is able to mm -hmm. balance that. Mm -hmm. Claudia got m many of her articles published in the Daily Worker and other places came from the Women International Democratic Forum. So she was part of that. I don't know if she was an official member, mm -hmm. but she was definitely involved in that. Okay, experiences as a black feminist. I just wrote a piece and I, I wrote it while I was mm -hmm. away, so who knows how, how I'll be treated when I go back. Mm. <laughs> but um, I wrote a piece and you can find it. Please look for it. It's called The Persistence of Institutional Sexism in African oh, Studies. Okay. And it's a critique of my own department. Oh my goodness. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because for 50 years, they have never had a woman as the director of any program. Mm. The the men who founded mm. it, like Turner, and they, they were, I mean, I, I still sympathize with Turner because his logic was to try to get African studies, you know, solidified in a building and all sort of place and all that. So he was able to do that, but he never groomed any young leadership, male or female, and definitely not any woman. Subsequent to that, almost all of, every single lead of director has been a, a man. And the university has not, even with people like me and others, not just me, like three or four of us who have experience, for some reason the men, the way that they do it, the men vote for each other so that women don't get ever selected. And if, and then if you only have like three women in the department and it's like five men, you know, just think about how that vote is going to go. So it's like a relay race that I say the baton is passed from man to man and the administration co-signs it. And I think, I, I, I don't know if Rhoda would even say this is true, but I was talking to her colleague, Pat Mohammed, and she feels the same way in mm -hmm. terms of University of the West Indies, that you may have movement, mm -hmm. but you still have the institutional sexist mm -hmm. structures in place that then block women from mm -hmm. having that full participation. Mm -hmm. So, but, but how could I be a, a black feminist scholar um, who critiques these issues in writing and then I'm in a department where it's so blatant and obvious and I say nothing. So I think I'm at a point in my career where I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> really. So uh, I'm just saying it's an ongoing struggle to, and, mm -hmm. and one is always pushing. But keep in mind, this is not all the departments. Columbia has far with Jasmine Griffin. Um, and this is what I said in that piece. Harvard had has had many different leaders. This is specific to that department. 
So I wanted to bring mm -hmm. that to the attention. I have to say, though, that the provost called me and wanted to have a meeting with me, and then I, I was not on campus. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we did have a phone meeting, a Zoom or Skype meeting, and he, he was, seemed very sympathetic and asked me, did you want to be the director? <laughs> and I said, why would I? I mean, I said it would be kind of messed up for me just to write an, exactly, an article yeah, to be yeah, director. Yeah, 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 no. I'm raising an issue that is problematic, <laughs> and it would look really bad if you <laughs> write it, and then your aim is just to become the director. <laughs> but then I had people saying, well, you should ask him for this and this and this. <laughs> because this is what people do, you know, yeah. like, hook me up, give me That's more, 10,000 more. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's uh, but it's it's part to me of the of the energy, the passion. The, I don't feel. Um, I think you have to. I, my model is you have to do the work so that you can't be challenged intellectually, or they know yes, you have, you yes, have your 69 yes. published articles or your how many number and your books, so that they know that you are an intellectual or you're a scholar. Yes. But you also have a responsibility to have the the, the critical lens that allows you to say that this is messed up and I can <laughs> say that but some you know timing you have to think about when you're gonna you're mm -hmm. not gonna just put yourself out there so that you can be heard because mm -hmm. some people have been hurt mm -hmm. by raising questions that are in a certain way if, yeah. you, if it's not well received and so on. so that's what I'm seeing in terms of experiences um, relationships personal relationships I have been married and I have two adult daughters and three grandchildren mm -hmm. and um, and the feminist questions was always a battle in my marriage um, but my my ex I tell my students this story all the time because it's a good one my ex-husband um, who was an MD medical doctor he went he when he first was trying to become a resident in psychiatry he came he went for an interview and when he came back from the interview, he asked me, who is this Fanon? <laughs> <laughs> so I had students who like, I'm going to do a research on Fanon because I need to go to medical school and I don't want that to happen to me. So basically, Franz Fanon is a Martinican psychiatrist who worked with, in France with the Algerian Revolution and wrote all these books, as you know, most of you would have read them at different points. Mm -hmm. but, but basically, in other words, the logic we had was that what I was doing was cute and interesting and different, but it didn't have anything to do with what he was doing as a big MD. So basically you struggle with the value that is put on work and so on, and I think that was my, that was my own personal situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay. Good. So thanks a lot, very much for this intellectual, also political <laughs> activist and also <laughs> personal um, insights. I think that we are in the midst of it. When you talk to black uh, matters activists, actually, they're doing a lot of work uh, in order to, and us also here, in order to, um, yeah, to see and and listen to what we haven't done before. So it's part of a, a history that's not being told, it's mm -hmm. not being taught, and it's something that we are working on. And that's what I've seen, for example, in regard to young activists, for example, in the United States at the moment where we are also in touch and where we also learn a lot from having this conversation. So we're still going on in this kind of um, understanding of the world and also transformation of it. So thanks a lot. It was really a historical moment. <laughs> <laughs> Our thank honor you. here. Yeah. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.